uh, we had an interesting perspective and mix about what our panelists are leaning into. Now I'm kind of curious, uh, shifting it to the other side, um, what are we avoiding? What is it we don't like? What are we worried about? Um, and what are we underweighting these days? So, John, why don't you kick us off on that topic? Well, I, I think the low interest rate environment was very favorable for, for private equity, um, both in terms of buyouts and mid-market private equity. Because you think about it, that's in an intrinsically a levered asset class. So I think in terms of locking up capital for four, six, eight, 10, 12 years right now in private equity, I think it's, it better be a top quartile manager with a specialization that aligns with with your own interest and objectives. So I think private equity is probably going to be more challenged. I think, you know, it's it's equity markets on on steroids. You know, hedge funds have been a diff, really a difficult 10-year period, if you think about it, whether you look at the HFRA index, which has a lot of survivorship bias. But in general, even the, even the brand name hedge funds with excellent managers have struggled. COVID was a doozy. Low interest rates, frankly, were a doozy. And I think, you know, kind of breaking hedge funds down you know, they're not really negatively correlated to equity markets, I think. You know, there's some, some are market neutral, I suppose. Uh, but really, they're, they're negatively correlated to duration, which I think is something, which is a sort of a concept and allocation that, that probably deserves to be explored a little more. <clears throat> so if you think about that right now, after we've had this, you know, sort of 350, point, 350 basis point move, you know, where does, that, where does that leave kind of hedge funds as an asset class? Now, you know, within hedge funds, there's so many sub-asset classes and the quants have really, you know, done a great job principally in the last, you know, kind of 15 years. So, but I'd say in general, we're, we're underweight private equity, underweight hedge funds for those reasons. I mean, to be devil's advocate, talking about uh, the hedge fund, uh, there's some panels that will be happening later in the afternoon about the hedge fund conundrum. But the question is, yeah, why are people interested in an asset class that year to date is up maybe five, six percent when it's pretty much where cash rates are? Um, so, yeah, it is a challenge. Well, I, I think the reason investors like hedge funds is, is the risk management is typically very, very good, if not outstanding. And a few names come to mind, you know, we won't dig into them, that have just knocked it out of the park with, with risk management. I think a lot of people in this room, you know, have, have been a part of that in terms of providing tools to hedge funds, you know, that allow them to risk manage in a, in a constructive way. And I think particularly if you advise into the high net worth space, you know, you, you face this concept they call statement risk, and, the, and clients just don't want assets going down. Now, they can live with equity volatility because I think most investors understand what that is. But hedge funds, you know, if it promises X and it delivers Y, there's that, that basic disconnect. And the good ones have managed risk well. And I think they'll continue to manage risk well. And, uh, and I think the, the tools in the toolkit are getting better for risk management. So that's the, that's the silver lining here on the hedge fund business. That definitely is the hedge fund proposition, definitely as a diversifier and for capital preservation. And uh, as people get more and more concerned about being in long only, uh, both in equities and fixed income. So that's for sure. Uh, Scott, how about yourself? What is it that uh, we're avoiding these days? What do you think should be underweight? Uh, you know, I, I, would, I would definitely agree on the PE side. You know, I think equity markets, broadly speaking, um, and markets in general, people have gotten very used to interest rates that, have, you know, if you look at a very long time horizon, have done nothing but go down. Many investors, that's all they've ever seen. And in the last 18 months, you know, that's changed. And I think that really has a big implication on what you're going to do and what makes sense. Um, large cap, private equity, like I, I would totally agree. Multiples haven't moved much. Your interest costs are higher. You could have wage pressures. Like, so many of the drivers to generating returns are in your face as opposed to being a tailwind. Um, we're not focused there. Um, you know, I, I would say with respect to diversifying assets, whether it's hedge fund or credit, um, we have leaned more into credit than hedge funds. I think um, hedge funds were a big part of our portfolio a number of years ago, but combination of lower dispersion and the equity-based strategies and tax inefficiencies um, were challenges, particularly before the family moved to Puerto Rico. Um, we have a little less tax sensitivity there now, but there's, there's still hesitation about paying lots of fees and locking up capital uh, to generate returns that aren't outsized versus things that we can 
understand fundamentally and, and, and get our arms around. So, you know, I would say things we're underweighting, equities, broadly speaking, uh, large cap private equity buyout in particular. Uh, I do think there are some opportunities at the low end of the private equity market if you can buy at very low multiples in defense of businesses and do add-ons. Um, but I feel a lot better paying a 5 PE than a 8, 10, 12, 14 plus PE. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot to do on credit, but you got to be thoughtful about the world we're living in and the drivers of return um, to find the right, right spots. A uh, five PE sounds a lot better than uh, uh, large cap, uh, large cap tech trading at a forty-five PE, but and no dividends. You yeah, know. T t tech's a whole different story. And you, by the way, we're huge fans of tech. It's the biggest allocation we have. Um, it's the reason that the family moved from Florida to Puerto Rico. Um, so we love tech, um, but we're not adding as much there as we are to other spots. You know, it's interesting already, uh, so far two panelists raise issues about um, uh, caution warranted with the equity rally, uh, and so much has changed just even the last week alone when you look at uh, the resiliency in the markets, uh, softer data, uh, slowing growth, saying that the hiking cycle, you know, has been in effect, and uh, the Fed telegraphing that uh, the market taking pricing out no more hikes right now. Um, the refunding announcement was a lot less uh, onerous than people thought. Bank of Japan was a lot less aggressive than people thought. Positioning lightened up so much that now you have this like risk on rally, uh, technically bounced off long term averages. Uh, the technical crowd likes it, people focusing on the seasonals into a year end rally. So, you know, the question is um, how much more can this party uh, continue, even though caution is warranted? But it seems that, you know, with, with rates rallying as much as it did, like 50 bips in the last uh, 10 days. You know, maybe this uh, the party can continue uh, for quite but, longer. But notwithstanding the recent rally, which actually makes the math even worse. You know, traditionally, if you look at the last 50 years of history, is you, you're supposed to get paid an equity risk premium to own equities, which are more volatile than you are for risk-free assets. Right now, if you look at the inverse of your PE your earning yields on the S&P 500 is something like 50 basis points below the 10-year Treasury rate. You know, the long-term average over the last 50 years is something like 27 basis points. If that reverts, equity markets will be down 15%. And if you look at the equity risk premium during periods where rates are increasing, it looks more like 225 basis points, which implies equities are 40% overvalued. I, I'm not in the camp that things are going to crash tomorrow, but I do think you could see a sustained period where credit and contractual returns outperform equities, whether that's because equities are flat or they go down some. Um, you know, we can all talk about what could happen, but, you know, that, that's, you know, math over very long periods of time. And I, I do think people are really underestimating the tailwind that we've all had from declining discount rates on risk assets over the last 40 plus years. Yeah, that's an important observation that people um, uh, seem to forget when they see that the, things like the NASDAQ has such limited drawdowns and it's uh, behaving like a treasury bill in terms of drawdowns. It it's did, easy to forget I what th happens. I think in, in 2001 there was a pretty big drawdown in the NASDAQ. <laughs> exactly. My Linda, how about yourself? What areas are you underweighting or you think um, that you're avoiding? Yeah, I mean, with a um backdrop of higher rates for longer, elevated inflation, high, uh, uh, volatility, we want to be conservative. We want to be defensive. So we want to be high in the capital structure um, on, the, on the credit side and uh, on the equity side, we're investing in real assets, which are inflation hedged. Um, in terms of the corporates, I mean, there has been a lot of inflow into the private credit space but it's all grown after the financial crisis. So we haven't really seen a, a distress cycle in the private credit side. And we expect that the default rates will co pick up. Companies are already starting to see um, pressure on the margins and the EBITDA uh, breaching covenants. So we're gonna see more and more of that. So it's important to be with companies that are non-cyclical that can withstand this, this market cycle. Uh, but will we see blood? We will see blood. Um, and so that's why it's very important to stay high in the capital structure, good quality companies. You don't need to go, you know, to take a lot of risk to generate 
good good returns today. Uh, and I mentioned real estate backed. We, that's that's our sweet spot. Over 70% of our private credit portfolios in real estate assets. And so there we're avoiding office and retail. We're primarily focused on multifamily and uh, and industrial. But in, in real estate, there's three um, character, three items that are critical. It's location, location, and location. So at the end of the day, you know, where is this real estate asset? Will it always have demand? Even if it's an office space, there's some office spaces that are, you know, the occupancy rate has come back to pre-COVID crisis levels, whereas others are just empty. There's office space that are high rise, harder to, to lease, and there's others that are walk-ups, uh, suburban, uh, with ability to even transition them into ind industrial or multifamily. So it's all about location and, and supply demand. On the real asset side, um, on the equity, so we do also equity investments on real assets. Uh, what we do there is real estate, infrastructure, agriculture, and timberland. Uh, what we like about these assets in, in the current market environment, especially with the inflation and, and uh, cap rates rising or discount rates rising, is that they provide the inflation hatch. So the cost basis is increasing, whether it's um, cost of leverage, labor, supplies. But at the same time, uh, these assets are raising the revenue side. So on the real estate side, we're renewing rents at a higher level. So the cap rate increase is causing valuations to come down. But at the same time, the higher rents are causing valuations to go up. So um, when you know, it's all about leverage at the end of the day. So if you're not levered on these real estate assets, they're with, with they're holding really well, especially in Canada. We've we've seen quite quite a bit of stability, whereas in US we've seen quite a, a drag in real estate assets. On the infrastructure side, take an example of ferry business. Labor costs have gone up, oil costs has gone up, but at the same time the ticket prices are going up. So that's offsetting the, the cost. On the agricultural side, uh, the labor is, is, is gone up. We're putting uh, more resources into making more efficient uh, technology to, to, to generate produce. But at the same time, like the, the cherry prices have gone up. So those are the assets that we like. We try to be conservative and, uh, and withstand the this, this cycle. Thank you, Melinda. And Neil, how about yourself? What areas are you underweighting? Um, I, I agree with uh, Scott and John, such that you know private equity at this stage maybe not so attractive, particularly you know from a valuation perspective. Um, very liquidity conscious, uh, we are as well. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll add an anecdote. Um, probably from 2014 to 2018, I personally I was going to to Hong Kong to Singapore once a quarter or more. Um, there was significant demand for us to deploy assets there. Significant demand for us to diligence deals over there. And then since then, it's it's zero. Um, so you know, for for what it's worth, there's not a whole lot of interest um, that I've seen for other folks or institutional investors to to allocate over there. It's amazing what a five percent risk-free rate will do, huh? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Greg, and your thoughts? Sorry. Thank you. Um, we're going last. You can kind of echo everybody, I guess. Uh, we are. We will definitely be taking some money away from from equity uh, allocations, uh, both on the on the public side and, and probably reduce commitments on the private equity side, uh, for the reasons we touched on before. Quite simply, if we can get the returns we're looking for out of fixed income, why not? Uh, we don't need to take the extra risk of, to uh, to try and generate the the higher returns. Uh, we'd rather forego that uh, to to get ourselves what we think can be you know low double digit returns in many cases or or high single digit with very low risk. Uh, if we can do that, that fits. Uh, that primarily will be coming from the equity. It may end up coming a little bit from some of uh, the hedge fund strategies that I would describe as bond replacement strategies that have generated sort of four to five over the last handful full of years when risk-free rate was zero that actually wasn't so bad but if they if they only go to seven or eight uh then all of a sudden you're you know it doesn't look so good so i think that those will be the two areas where we pull capital from to deploy uh predominantly to to credit and and to your point one of the reasons that we have an energy allocation um, melinda's point on on things that are uh inflation linked that's why we have a real assets allocation and and, sim and we also like the fact that there are other folks that won't touch it for for esg reasons which 
is you know perfectly valid, but it just means that there's we think there's a capital hole, and we think that these assets are going to be used in our uh, you know in our economy for uh, for longer than I'm going to be working. 